Good morning. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks uh, to the organizers for inviting me. It's a great honor uh, and pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you. And uh, yeah, all that's relevant for my talk about me uh, has already been said. Um, and uh, uh, I am a philosophy teacher here, and I am the father of uh, two very young children. The younger one is just three months old, very, very fresh still. And uh, yeah, that's going to inform my talk, these two things, philosophy and being, my f uh, being a father. And you can see the title, The Most Completely New Beginning, that I'm going to explain in a moment. But it's uh, some thoughts on being born and uh, coming to grips with having to die, which has been a big topic in my life. And actually becoming a father really kind of helped me with that. So that's what I want to share with you a little bit today. Okay, um, one disclaimer before we start. This talk is not really... Uh, new beginning. Um, it doesn't claim to be original. An actual new beginning, intellectually speaking, would have to contain new ideas. I can't really uh, deliver that, so new, no new ideas in this talk, but uh, some interesting ideas to share with you guys and uh, to weave them together a little bit with my own experience as a father and um, yes. Uh, so that's uh, uh, no claim to originality uh, here. Now, um, why should be being born be the most complete new beginning? Yeah. That's uh, it's a bit of a, a pretentious title, if you will. Uh, you might think the most complete new beginning would be the beginning uh, of the universe, in fact, uh, the Big Bang. But um, who knows if that's really uh, the most new beginning. According to some physical theories, actually there have been many Big Bangs and our Big Bang. Uh, was just uh, one in a whole chain, and it just goes on and on and on, and then there wouldn't be really a new beginning uh, to speak of in the physical world. Yeah? On the other hand, being born uh, is a new beginning, yeah? a new space, a new consciousness, a new space for experience, a new subjectivity, something entirely new coming in the world that in some sense comes uh, without precedence, without anything having been there uh, before. Um, and uh, so in that, from that you can already uh, see that uh, I don't believe in reincarnation. When we come into this world, we are completely fresh. Yeah? So say no to reincarnation. Yeah? Uh, like these reformed Buddhists there, um, their reason to be against reincarnation is not mine. Yeah? Don't make the same mistake twice. <laughs> but this brings me uh, to my uh, next point, and that is are these new beginnings really something we want? Are they desirable? Are these new beginnings something good? And there are two objections one hears to new humans being born that are quite common, I think. And the first one has been maybe most eloquently expressed by the uh, uh, Greek tragic poet Sophocles. And I quote from him, not to be born at all is best, by, uh, is best far best that can befall. Um, and uh, next best, when born with least delay, to trace the backward way. Yeah. So life is so horrible that it's better not to be born at all. And if we're born, better go back to where we came from, into nothing, uh, as quickly as possible. So Sophocles, the first antinatalist against being born, um, it's hard to argue with something like that, so I'm not going to try. Yeah. Uh, I obviously disagree. Uh, I, quite fond of life, and uh, obviously I've had two kids, so I, I don't agree. But one, here's a milder version of this objection quite frequently, and that's the idea that a world like ours, so beset with problems, injustice, climate change, so on and so forth, it's irresponsible or selfish or unacceptable to bring new life into a world like ours. And that, I think, is not at all a very good objection, and I'm try to make clear in my talk why. Now, the other uh, objection against uh, new uh, life being born is um, one that we humans should make ourselves immortal. Now, you may ask, why is that an objection against birth? But I would say, if you think that through, once uh, some people don't die anymore, then uh, if that goes on indefinitely, at some point, uh, there's not going to be space anymore for new life. So if we want to make ourselves immortal, at the same time, we would abolish birth we would abolish new life, new beginnings in this way. 
And that, I don't think, uh, would be a good thing. Um, but this is a much stronger, I think, objection to um, new life, the new beginning of new life. Yeah? I think this desire for immortality, or perhaps also the fear of death, it's sometimes hard to say what's more fundamental, but surely both are an absolutely fundamental part of the human experience. Yeah? It's part of what makes us humans. It's one of the really primordial impulses that we have. Yeah? And uh, uh, so one sees this, of course, in religion, in myths, in poetry, in philosophy. Uh, this desire for immortality is everywhere. The idea of eternal life. Uh, um, and uh, just a few examples. The first epic poem that we're aware of, Gilgamesh, uh, is about the quest, a man's quest for immortality. Uh, philosopher, ancient Greek philosopher Epicurus thought that uh, our fear of death is what stands most in the way of happiness. And that's something we have to come to terms with. Yeah? And uh, finally, Michel de Montaigne, another example, he also thought that actually to philosophize is to learn how to die. And this is the most important thing, is to come to terms with our uh, finitude. And it's very, very difficult. We have to try all our lives to do that. And this is an objection that incidentally hits really close to home for me. Yeah? So this fear of dying has been a really powerful uh, force in my life and uh, started when I was about nine years old that I kind of realized, well, this is coming to an end at some point and it just freaked me completely out. Yeah? And I think it's a very difficult uh, thought to bear. And I think, uh, I know not all human beings share <laughs> the difficulty of coming to terms uh, with death, but uh, uh, many do, and I think many are motivated by this, and, um, and uh, including me. So, uh, in a sense, I think this is a very powerful objection to, uh, to the idea of new beginnings uh, with new birth. Yeah? But, um, uh, de so death is terrifying, we may ask, like, why not get rid of it, and actually nowadays, we probably have the means to do so fairly soon. Yeah? Um, a famous gerontologist, uh, Audrey de, uh, Gray, thinks actually that the first human being uh, to live a thousand years has already been born. Yeah? Imagine that, that uh, with medical advances we could uh, get to a point where everybody gets really, really old. This is uh, Audrey, Audrey de Bray. He looks like he's a thousand years already, uh, but um, uh, he has his proper TED talk, which is called A Roadmap to Ain uh, End Aging, which is, of course, in a sense of euphemism for saying a roadmap to, map to abolishing death. Yeah? So, but again, to spell it out, if uh, uh, it's really just a matter of time uh, until we can abolish death, then um, uh, uh, yeah, th death becomes optional. Some people will doubtlessly do it. Yeah? And if some people will do it, then uh, at some point we'll run out of space for new humans. Yeah? And uh, so abolishing death would in the long run mean abolishing new humans being born. And yeah, so we, we, we can ask ourselves, so what's the problem with that? Why would that be a bad idea? Yeah? And here, um, short answer is, I think life would become terribly boring. Stale, stagnant, without novelty, without innovation. And um, I'm going to draw now on three philosophers to make this point a little bit more convincing, uh, namely Hannah Arendt and uh, uh, William James and uh, G.K. Chesterton, uh, to spell this out a little bit. I want to start with Hannah Arendt. She has this idea that natality, being born, is really one of the fundamental aspects of the human condition. And uh, this is Hannah Arendt. And in fact, it is so because it is the possibility for human freedom. Yeah? The fact that humans, uh, beings are born and new human, uh, humans keep arriving is what uh, creates the possibility for us to be free. And to be free, she says, means to, uh, to have the ability to start something new, something unpredictable, something that is not really inherent in the way things are already, to break open. Yeah? Human life, this is something I think that we appreciate about human life, that it's open-ended. We don't know where this journey takes us, e both individually and collectively. Yeah? So uh, uh, for Arendt, freedom doesn't mean that you can, can choose between two options, yeah? a kind of freedom of choice, um, the ability to do otherwise, as philosophers say. Uh, but for her, it's about doing something unpredictable, starting something new, making a new beginning, breaking established patterns. Yeah? And for her, this is especially important in uh, politics. Uh, so some examples, yeah, the French Revolution, uh, May 68, 
um, now Fridays for Future, all of these things, uh, political uh, n movements for something new. Uh, this is what Arendt calls action, and she thinks it's possible only on the basis of um, uh, uh, natality, yeah? of uh, new uh, being born, new uh, humans being born. Okay, little quote from Arendt uh, um, uh, I want to share with you. So action has the closest connection with the human uh, condition of natality. The new beginning inherent in birth can make itself felt in the world only because the newcomer possesses the capacity of beginning something anew, that is of acting. So in the sense of initiative, an element of action and therefore natality is inherent in all human activities. Uh, so this is really what enables us to do radically new things. So human beings as themselves being radically new beginning are the uh, uh, condition of possibility for new beginnings in the social sphere and in all spheres of human life. Yeah? So from being born, we get uh, new uh, things uh, in the social world. Okay, so this sounds very nice, but why should that be so actually? Why couldn't we imagine innovation and so on going on without infusion of new life? And here I want to draw real quick on the thought of uh, uh, another philosopher, and that's William James. And I'm just going to read to you guys uh, a quote because uh, he writes so beautifully and poetically that I uh, couldn't express it better myself. Um, and uh, he says the following about, um, about uh, uh, yeah, how we get set in our ways. In each of us, a saturation point is soon, re soon reached in all things that interest us deeply. The impetus of our purely intellectual zeal expires. And unless the topic be one associated with some uh, urgent personal need, we settle into an equilibrium and live on what we've learned when wha our interest was fresh and instinctive and we don't add further to the store. So we have some initial experiences with set which set our course and then we don't really add to it anymore. He says, outside of their own business, the ideas gained by human beings before they're 25 are practically the only ones they'll ever have. Yeah. They cannot get anything new. Disinterested curiosity is past, the mental grooves uh, and channels set, uh, the power of assimilation gone. And he says, well, if you know some innovative old people, they're just the exception that proves the, proves the rule. So he thinks, um, and I think this is very convincing, that to make really new beginnings on a big scale, we also need uh, uh, new life, new babies. Yeah? Now, we don't only need this, uh, um, um, uh, we need this, uh, uh, but uh, we don't only need this, but it's also something inherently wonderful and beautiful. And here I want to draw a little bit, uh, of course, on my own experience, but uh, also I want to introduce you to a, a little bit less known thinker, uh, Chesterton, who expresses this thought of human uh, uh, children, uh, babies being a new beginning, extremely beautifully. And I want to share this quote with you as well. He says, the fascinating, uh, fascination of children lies in this, that with each of them, all things are remade, and the universe is put again upon its trial. Uh, as we walk the streets and see below us those delightful bulbous heads, three times too big for the body, we ought always to remember that within every one of these heads there is a new universe. In each of those orbs there is a new system of stars, new grass, new cities, a new sea. The world is constituted anew. Yeah, there is a new space for experience, a new way to appropriate the world, to make it your own, find new perspectives, new approaches. And uh, this is really something that only happens once in a lifetime when we come into the world fresh. Yeah? And uh, so this wonder that children have, I think it uh, helps us also get back to that sense of wonder. And wonder is, of course, something very, very important. Philosophy starts with wonder. In a sense, innovation starts with wonder. Uh, um, uh, Aristotle tells us already, in all things of nature, there's something marvelous, something to be wondered at. And uh, children can help us reconnect with that. Yeah, with a sense of marvelousness of the world. And here again, I want to ch uh, share with you a quote by Chesterton. The influence of children goes further. It forces us actually to remodel our conduct in accordance with this revolutionary theory of the marvelousness of all things. 
Yeah, we do actually treat t talking in children, talking in children as marvelous, walking in children as marvelous, common intelligence in children as marvelous, and that attitude towards children is right. Yeah? Our attitude towards grown-ups, where we take it for granted, is wrong. Yeah? So having kids, and this, uh, I think, is something very powerful when you have kids, you, you learn how amazing it is, all the things that we can do, because you see how we learn it, how we appropriate it, yeah? how, we, how it comes about, and uh, how much wonder and amazement is involved in this uh, uh, process. And so we get to see the world again through the eyes of a child. Yeah? Children, for them, everything is wonderful. Everything is marvelous, and uh, they, we, in comparison, have become kind of stunted to the amazing quality of things. Yeah? And so children can help us uh, restore a sense of wonder. Yeah? A child, a small baby looking at a mobile is absolutely fascinated by that. You know? And, and uh, so in a sense, you know, they, they, can, they remind us how amazing it is what we can do. A little anecdote that I always like to tell when my uh, son started to grasp that we can use the same words uh, for different things of the same kind. Yeah? He was so fascinated by this. We would sit at the dinner table and he would just say, that's a plate, that's a plate, that's a plate. And he was just absolutely, he thought that's the greatest thing that he discovered. Oh, we can use the same, the same word refers to different things. We take that completely for granted. And uh, children kind of remind us of that. Yeah? Um, now, uh, also this has a kind of trickle down effect, if you will. I think that it helps us to reconnect with things on this basic level. And lots of new and great ideas, I think, come exactly through a process of going back to the basics, yeah? of this wonder at the most fundamental and seemingly most simple uh, things. Yeah? And so being a parent uh, involved and generally having to do with kids involves the seeing the world again through new eyes. And I think, yeah, without new life, uh, not only is there not a new infusion of life uh, itself, but also for us a source of inspiration and renewal goes away. Yeah? And now to close, I want to just say uh, some general remarks, come back to the fear of death part. For me, uh, appreciating new life kind of helped me to come to terms also with uh, death, with my own finitude. Yeah? So seeing the marvelousness of a new life actually helped me to accept that at some point I will have to go. Yeah? And without that, without us who are already here at some point making way, all these uh, things that I talked about, innovation, novelty, new beginnings, and also just the concrete beauty of new life would not be possible. Yeah? So on the intellectual level, this is important, but I think you need to kind of feel it up close, viscerally, um, uh, to really uh, grasp the point fully. And so when in class, when we were talking about death and how hard it is to kind of stomach it, and maybe the extent to which death uh, can make, can seem to make life meaningless, I told my students that, um, yeah, they should uh, uh, consider having kids at some point if they find themselves in the dark spot where they don't really know what to do with life anymore. And uh, one of my students uh, uh, made the very sensible objection to say, Mr. Bulling, you're aware we're just 17 years old. I say, okay, yes, not right now, not right now. All in due course, but um, I think it's, uh, it's something um, uh, uh, crucial, and both on the individual level, and if you think that the world is a nasty and cruel place and putting babies in it might not be the best idea, I would say think again, because these babies are the condition of possibility for it to be better one day uh, by making also a social new beginning. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, all in due course, the having babies part, of course. All right. Thank you very much, and um, that's it from me.